Check, check, check. Hey, everyone, how y'all doing tonight? <laughs> this is going to be a lot of fun. You guys are uh, going into the, not Guinness, let's call it the Chicory Stout record, record book. Uh, this is the biggest beer dinner in the history of Dogfish Head tonight. So you guys are part of it. What an awesome theme. What a great reason to do this. Uh, our kitchen's back there working diligently on the, on the biggest beer dinner we've ever done in 24 years. You're in for a treat. Chef Lou and Brian, who runs the brewing program, up, will be up here in between each course to talk about the thoughtful uh, pairings that they have put together with a ton of creativity, grace, and aplomb. Uh, and I'm going to invite my, my good friend, David Lemieux, up to talk Grateful Dead awesomeness uh, with me. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, and uh, thanks everyone for coming out. The, uh, the dead uh, band members are busy, couldn't come, but <laughs> sorry. So you got me and Sam. Cheers, um, Cheers buddy. Thanks, buddy. Um, so if you have questions, if you want to come talk to us, we're here for you. And we got a great dinner lined up, incredible food, yep. great beer. Thoughtful pairings. When you walk into a building and they hand you a grilled cheese on the way in, you, you know you're in for a special night. You're in the right place. You know? But David, we've uh, gotten to know each other for over half a decade now. We got to drink many beers on the old porch of the old brew pub when you came and did the first test batch of this beer with us in 2012, was 2012, it? 2012, seven years ago. And uh, we brewed it right next door yeah. and uh, tasted it that night. And it was good then and now seven years later, yeah. even better. And tell, you, you, you know, the, the way that you guys vetted and, and your, 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 your uh, co-workers from Warren Music came down from New York, props ladies. Uh, but you guys, obviously you have to vet opportunities of companies to engage with because that line between, you know, art and commerce can be uncomfortable if it's done in a rough, rough way. But I know you guys did your research. Uh, how, how did this come to be from your perspective, this collaboration? Around 2011, we started talking about uh, doing a beer and a few people threw out names like some of the, the bigger names and we all said no. And then the New York crew started suggesting some. Uh, some, some of the Warner Music people from New York City are here and we want to thank them because they really started this seven years ago. And they suggested a few. Uh, well, they didn't suggest a few. They suggested they went with Dogfish Head and said, look, look these guys up. And I called a friend of mine in Portland, Oregon, who is a, uh, he's, he owns three bars. And I said, hey, what do you know about Dogfish Head? I live in Canada, so I, I don't know. We don't have it there yet. 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 And so my buddy Nate in, uh, in Portland, he said, man, you can't get a better independent brew. It's the best. And the guy who, and I didn't ask him anything about Sam. I didn't know anything about Sam. And he said, let me tell you, the guy who owns this place, Sam, he is the most solid individual you will ever meet. And in our business, in the Grateful Dead world, and, and New York will tell you, personality goes far. And we don't want to work with um, people. Douchebags. Douchebags. <laughs> and so, so my buddy, my buddy, uh, the bar owner, had met, had met Sam at a couple of events. And he said, this guy, and he knew enough about the business as a bar owner. He said, He's the guy, and everybody else did their, their other due diligence, whether that was on the business side or the, the beer side or whatever it was, and I did mine based on a buddy saying, Sam's a good guy, and that's all I needed to hear, and we came out a few months later and, uh, and brewed that first batch. So seven years later, we're still doing it. Yep. Yep. And uh, th those of you maybe less familiar with the, the, the story of, of the, uh, the, the recipe itself, but it's a cool story, and it just shows how unique the Grateful Dead is and, and how they span generations. Uh, of, of inter interest and influence. So when, when the, the certain band members, uh, when, when we decided to do this together, the band themselves chose the base style of beer. They wanted it to be a big American pale ale with only American uh, ingredients in it because we knew we wanted to call it American beauty. Um, and then we knew that the power of the Grateful Dead's network of enthusiasts would be perfect to mobilize to help us uh, you know, make this recipe, you know, really sing and, and have the DNA of Dogfish Head's culinary approach to brewing in it. So we collectively sent out a, a bat signal uh, on dead.net and dogfish.com and we got thousands of uh, responses when we said, hey, it's going to be a pale ale. You guys tell us what uh, culinary ingredients should go into it. 
and what were we got thousands of responses. What were some of the popular responses? Uh, hemp, hemp, uh, anything pot related? Hemp pot, yep. mushrooms, yep. acid. And we literally had, and we literally had, when you went to the screen to to put your 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 idea in, the first screen on, on the website was to the portal. You had to click, and it said, "Enter here to." To, to put an ingredient, and you can't put anything illegal. And you can see these folks at home so psyched to participate. They're at, okay, they're, okay, not, not illegal, okay, click. And then the next thing they do is, weed. <laughs> we got a lot of that. But we also got some beautiful stories of people with, uh, I, you know, sharing their stories on awesome memories of the dead and, uh, and different, different ingredients. And this guy, Tom, had a beautiful story. His earliest memory as a child was being in, in, the, in the parking lot at a dead show with his mom and his dad. And they, didn't, they came from a poor family, and they could only afford one ticket to the show that was going through their town. And his earliest memory was eating granola in the parking lot of the show and his dad handing him over the fence to his mom, <laughs> who had the ticket, which is a beautiful, beautiful uh, story. We invited he, he and his dad came and brewed the test batch with David and I. Uh, and, and, and away we went. What else do you remember of, of that, putting this thing together? I remember, you know, I remember the, the, the voting of the theme ingredients, and as soon as we heard what it was going to be, and, and this person had, had recommended granola, we all kind of started thinking, well, what does that mean? And we all came up with the same ideas. We wanted toasted almonds and, and oats and honey, and it was all these flavors that I eat at home. And I was like, well, let's have that in a beer. It's a, how could that be bad? And it's turned out to be infinitely better than I ever thought a beer could be. It's, it's a perfect beer for the Grateful Dead. It's smooth, it, it, it makes you come back and want more. It's, it's an incredible beer. No, we're, we're, we're super proud of it. Uh, before we take some questions, your, your official title is you're the archivist and the legacy manager of the Grateful Dead. That's a lot on your shoulders. Uh, it's, uh, you know, yeah, I'll tell you, uh, you know, You know, I, I, I honestly, I, I don't know if, if legacy manager sounds impressive to you, but what it came up with is when I was given uh, my role change with the band, and Weir said, well, we got to give you a new title. What do you want it to be? And I said, I don't know, just whatever you want. He said, what do you do? I said, I just kind of manage your legacy. And he said, well, then we're going to call you the legacy manager. So that you can thank Weir for that one. So other bands think, wow, do most bands have a legacy manager? I said, I don't know, I made it up. Weir made it up. So this was, this was weird deciding that uh, I'm the legacy manager, so. Uh. What do you think of a band that's, so, you know, you know Neil Young, uh, what, what did he say, better to fade out? You yep. know, what was that line? Than, than to die, yeah. Yeah, and, and there's only a number of artists who chose to do neither and stay relevant for four or five decades. I'd put Neil on that list, Patti Smith, Bob Dylan, and of course, the Grateful Dead. Do you ever wake up in the middle of the night and you're peeing and you're like, oh, Shit, I'm in charge of the Grateful Dead's legacy. How do you get back to sleep I, when you got that? That thought does cross my mind every single day. And it, what it does is it makes me realize how important, um, how big a responsibility it is. So I do take it seriously, and I like to have fun. I like to come to Delaware and work with you, and I do have a good time. Every moment of my day is fun. But I also take the job really seriously. So if anybody ever thinks it's, um, it's all fun and games, it is. But we do take it seriously. And, and the New York people will tell you that we do really work hard at making sure the Dead's legacy is protected and promoted and working with people like Sam. And that's why we're going with Sam. That's why we're here. I can tell you nobody else in the United States is doing this right now. So thank you, Sam. We're, we're pretty excited that you're here. On, on this time that we're up, we're not uh, going to do questions. But you guys be thinking of really good, good questions because... Uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, a couple friends that I, I work with. But before I do, and before we have too many beers and great courses together, I do want to take a moment and, and thank some folks uh, who really did the heavy lifting to make this amazing night happen, uh, which would be uh, Sophia in our marketing team, Neil, Alan, Janelle, uh, Jenny, uh, Ryan, Chef Lou, uh, Brian, Alex and Eleni who came down from New York. Uh, our, our band, this is going to be such a cool uh, night because it's really uh, so many components. So many of your senses are going to be uh, wowed. Uh, so High Tide Sideshow, let's give it up for them. You'll be hearing from them uh, very soon. And uh, I want to also thank Jim who gave me a beautiful tie-dye wherever he is in the room. God bless you, Jim. Very kind. 
Um, so David and I are super excited for tonight. We're going to get up. And David's going to do the heavy lifting on the Q&A, the heavy lifting. Uh, but you're in for a real treat. All right, as David's uh, coming up, let's give it up for High Tide's Sideshow. That was a great version of Bertha. They're good. Right? Thank you, guys. So uh, before we get into the Q&A thing, can you talk a little bit about how uh, you got onto this team? I know, you know, you reached out to Dick. You come from a, 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 a sort of a, a, a film background. But before we do that, can you tell us how you got on this journey? Well, uh, going back, uh, I started going to see the dead a long time ago, um, 30 something years ago. And I saw them a lot, and then I got really into uh, going to school, so I did that for a while. And then I, I finished a master's degree in film archiving, and I wrote Dick an email, who then contacted me about three months later and said, Hey, you should come look at our vault. And this was in 98. And then I went to see his vault, finished my grad school, and I wrote him a thank you letter. And I wrote, P.S. If you want somebody to catalog your video collection, give me a call. And Dick, oh, we are actually John Cutler, the Dead's producer at the time. Uh, he called me and said, were you serious? And I did. I came down for a three-month contract uh, 20 years ago last week, and I just stayed. And, you know, it's a grateful day way that you just kind of show up, and if you're doing an okay job, and, again, I guess personality goes far. I didn't piss anyone off. And then Dick passed away um, a couple months after I got there. So they said, you should just stick around. So I did, and then they just kept giving me more responsibility because I got the job done, I guess. And here I am drinking beer with you and... 2019. And it's it's uh, pretty cool because as as fragmented as the uh, as the music business gets, and there's less like massive albums that sell you know go platinum in a, in a short amount of time. But one thing that has been a constant is when the Grateful Dead does a, a new release, it almost automatically makes it into the top 50. What would be an example of that in the last few years? Literally every album we do. Okay, every, every example. Every That's one example. You know, so we, you know, we, do, um, we do these Dave's Picks things, and, and we do four times a year we're top 20, which is amazing. It blows the band away. The band doesn't really pay too much attention to the level of success. Um, they know Deadheads like the music that we put out, but they keep seeing these emails that we send them that were, you know, hey, you guys are top 12. You guys are... And it really blows them away. And then gold records keep showing up on our walls. And then this uh, tomorrow, no, on Sunday night, um, we're going to the Grammys because we've been nominated for, the, I think, the fifth year in a row, sixth year in a row. So, so we're going to do that. So, you know, for this band that's kind of under the radar, off-centered band that um, is, you know, people call it a cult band, I mean, it's, it's a cult band that seems to be doing okay, 54 years on. And, uh, you know, the Grammys are going to be fun, and then we just move right on to the next project and hopefully go back next year, and it'll be, it's always a good time. So we are going to start with some Q&A activity. I believe our coworker Janelle is in the house to help us. You're not Janelle. Oh, you got a question. And you're not Janelle. Oh, there's Janelle. Come on up, Janelle. How's this work? You want a mic? Sure. So we did some questions through our social media channels as well as uh, Grateful Dead social media channels. We're only going to take maybe two questions from social and then leave it to the rest of you guys. Um, but the first one, what's the inspiration for the label design? Uh, of the beer, do you think they meant? Or? Yeah. yeah. Why don't I start and talk about, and then maybe if you can... Uh, finished by talking about the, the bears, the iconic bears themselves. Uh, so at any rate, uh, we, we, we were super proud of this. Don't steal Ryan's t-shirts off this wall, uh, but uh, we're, we're very proud of the evolution of our, our, our artwork for our labels of American Beauty through the years. Uh, the most recent one that's in market now, uh, the, the six pack 12 ounce, is still 100% focused on the iconic bear, but there's a lot of personality in it that comes through from Michael Hacker, who is our uh, artist of our of this year. So the the same artist that did our Punk and Ale uh, um, and and our other sort of art series beers this year, Michael Hacker 
did the beautiful design of this year's American Beauty. But it must be interesting, you know, from, from a marketing perspective of the dead, most bands are lucky if they've got one iconic symbol, you know, the, 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 the font of ACDC or Aerosmith. But you guys have so many iconic images to, to choose from. Can you tell us a little bit? Uh, about the bear? Well, it, the bear is one of the first Grateful Dead logos, first um, trademarked, copyrighted, whatever um, it is. And it is related to the Grateful Dead had a benefactor and a sound guy going back to 1966, uh, Owsley Stanley. And he was known as the bear. Um, he was uh, an LSD chemist and he made enough money uh, selling LSD that he could fund this band and give them good sound equipment. So Bear did that for a while and he was known as the Bear, a great guy. He passed away about uh, six or seven years ago uh, in Australia. Wonderful man. So he was known as the Bear. So the, the Bear logos, when they put out an album called Bear's Choice about 46 years ago, uh, they put the, 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 the Bear logo, they created the Bear logo. And when we do something like the Dogfish Head Partnership, you know, we think of what's appropriate to give them to, to have Michael design it. And in the Grateful Dead's case, it's either Skull and Roses. And we thought, you know, Skull and Roses on food and beer is not really a thing you want. So we said, well, the Bears is the obvious one. And what we generally do, and, and the New York team will talk about this, but we, all, we, we really do trust the partners that we have. And so we'll give them to, to Dogfish Head, and we know that Michael will do a good job. And then he does a great design, as we've seen on the beers, and then we all look at them and approve them, or ask for changes, but for the most part, it's been sussed out really well, so we know uh, that what they're gonna do is tasteful. We, you know, we're not gonna partner with somebody, we're not gonna have a partnership with somebody who's gonna destroy our logo. So um, by the time we got it, I think there were very few changes on this one, if any, um, none. So we trust you, and you deliver something that's exactly what we expected, which is perfection. We were in sync, we were in sync, which is nice. And, it, and you can see we, we treat it very well, and props to my coworkers who led on redesigning this room for tonight. Uh, but we're really, really proud to take the design of our spaces as serious as the designs of our beer recipes that brewers like Brian do and our food recipes like Lou and, Lou and that team. So next question. So the key component in this pale ale is granola, but we do have a fan that's curious if there will be an addition with rose petals added. I'd be into it. If, if you guys would feel it would taste good and give it a try, I think that, you know, the Grateful Dead are so associated with roses. Skull and roses, roses all over. Um, I think this would be great. Give it a try. It could be a future uh, opportunity for us to explore. I heard a verbal contract from David right there. New York's giving him the thing over here. I think that means, yeah, we're on board too. So that might happen. So now we'll open it up to you guys. Feel free to raise a hand and I'll try to come track you down. Right here. How much influence does the band have on your choices for your release? The releases um, you have? I mean, they played the music um, about that much. They don't. We let them know. We always fill them in, and I'm in constant contact with them in terms of telling them what we're up to. And I think they get an overall big kind of uh, overview of what we're doing with the legacy in terms of this, a night like this. But when it comes to music-specific releases, I send them notes, very little input. Um, some comments, like, it's interesting. We'll get comments like, oh, I remember that show. That was the snowstorm when we ended up having to start two hours late, and we played till one in the morning instead of 11. So we do hear that sometimes, but otherwise in terms of I mean, they don't listen to it beforehand. They, I think after 20 years of doing it and 10 years of Dick doing it before that, they trust that what we're releasing is what you want. It's, because I don't think they're the ones to be judging their 40 and 50 and 20-year-old, 30-year-old music. So they trust that what... I, all my friends are deadheads, so it's not like I'm working in a vacuum. I listen to all of my friends. And I, I see the feedback that we get when we release something. So I think that they understand that. And they get deadheads coming up to them all the time saying, oh my God, that new thing you just put out from 1977 is incredible. And they hear that. They don't know what they're talking about maybe, but they hear that and they say, okay, these guys know what they're doing. So. Yeah, and to, con to add to that, you know, one, one of the coolest parts of your job today that I think is watching, you know, John Mayer integrate into Dead & Company and how, right, it's been beautiful, right? Uh, and, and how serious he has taken this part of his 
creative journey. And really, you know, David in a big way, uh, you know, acts as his dead Yoda as, a, as, a, as he went from a Padawan to a member of the band. In that, in that you, know, uh, you know, John reaches out to you to ask as the, as, the, as the dead put together a set list if there's songs that he might be less familiar with. How, describe for a moment that interaction between you and John. And it was particularly uh, very busy with him early on where the band would say, hey, John, we're going to go to rehearsal next week. Can you learn these 10 songs? And John would not know where to start. So I'll, I would choose things that, you know, as you were saying, is it in John's wheelhouse or is it something I want to push John towards? And oftentimes, you know, John might know a certain arrangement of a song, and then I'd push him in another direction. And then the band, that would be what the band wanted. So it was a, it, he's incredibly collaborative, and the guy works harder than anybody I've ever met. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. All right, next question. So I'm going to read this one, but it was submitted by one of our guests here tonight, uh, Mark from Ohio, that's sitting up there on the mezzanine. Thank you for typing this out. That was very thoughtful. Um, all right, so it, it's titled One Drummer Verse Two. One of the things that the dead is known for is having two drummers. However, many consider one of the band's peak performing periods to be the time between when Keith joined the band in 1971 through October of 1974, right before they took their quote-unquote hiatus. Considering the fact that they only had one drummer during this period, is there an argument to be made that having just one drummer was just as effective as having two? I feel like this question is directed to me. And I was just going to say I'm not touching that because I love the era that this question that Mark's asking about. Um, but I do, I find great Grateful Dead music in all eras. We, we've got a, an album coming out... Um, in a couple months from 1970, and that's two drummers. And then we just put out an album a couple weeks ago, a week ago, uh, from 1977. And I mean, I can't argue that that's some of the best music the Dead ever played. And likewise, Europe 72, when there's only one drummer, is also some of the best music the Dead ever played. So I don't generally get into, this is the best, this is the worst, this, I mean, it's kind of all subjective. But yeah, the Dead made some amazing music with only one drummer, and they also made some really incredible music with two, so. I mean, it's, I love it all. I mean, I can find great Grateful Dead music in all eras, and whether that's 1982 or 1993 or 1969, it's all good. And it's not all good, but there's, all, there's good in everywhere. And just, just to add to that, we, similarly in the beer world, folks are always asking, oh, what's your favorite beer that you guys make? And, and it's so similar, because everyone's palate is different, and that's a beautiful thing. That's why there's... 7,000 breweries in America uh, making th hundreds of different kinds of beers. Uh, but, you know, they, they do, like, you say they're all your children, the beers, and, and you, they're, they're, you love your children equally, but there are different times that you prefer hanging out with certain children than other children. At certain times. <laughs> Is there, not that you love it better, or, or not that you love it or it's the best, but if you had to say there was one release that you did in your picks that you've put on yourself the most, not that it's the best, it's the one you've hung out with the most. One release? Yeah. Probably, uh, probably the Europe 72 box set because it's 73 CDs of Bliss. Um, that one and some of the Spring 90, but we did two box sets from 1990. Both of those uh, I spend a lot of time listening to. Any other questions in the audience? You first. Hi. Good evening. Sam, first of all, how much for the Schlitz hat? I got it, on, I got it uh, at Analog Go Go, our, our, our festival, the folks at Sid Vintage, and I'm never selling it. It's priceless. Oh, man. Priceless. Okay. I'm going to have to find one. Okay, Dave. One question, and you probably get this a lot, but if you were on a deserted island and you only had three concerts, uh, three concerts that you had on tape to listen to for the next 10 years, what would those three concerts be? Great question. It's a tough one. Um, 
I, yeah, I, you know, I, I would say I, I'd say one of them would be 4872 in London, the second night of the Europe 72 tour. Um, shit, I don't. I'm oh, sorry. Um, I don't know, man. It's uh, again, I can't get stuck in any specific era. And and when we're working on something from whatever whatever it is, I get so into that era. And then when I step out of it, I find something else with completely different. You might have a pig pen show and might have a Vince show. And I find something really good to love about that. So it's hard for me. I get so into all of it. I wouldn't want to get stuck with three. So I don't know. I live on an island and luckily it's not deserted so I can listen to it all. Sam, should we challenge you with the same question? Three beers? No, three, three beers? Three albums, right? That was the question. Oh. Oh. No, I'll do beers. I'll do beers. I'll do beers that aren't our own. Um... We also, we play this as a go-around game with our family, and we say, if there was one album uh, that y y you had to be on the island with, one condiment. We, we say that uh, the I island comes with fresh water because of rain, and coconuts are a given, but you have to live off of one condiment, one album, um, and one beer. We play that game as a family. And so mine is relish, because it's awesome, and it's got some nutrient-rich stuff in it. We define condiment as it's free somewhere in a package, by the way. So think, think about that. Justin's peanut butter is cuspy. Sometimes they charge for that. People have tried to do that. Uh, and I would say uh, Sierra's celebration for not our beer, because it uh, was my, my cutting of my teeth uh, beer. And then I'd probably say uh, replacements. Sorry, Ma, I forgot to take out the trash as my favorite album. Although the first Dead album I bought was Shakedown Street. Uh, it gets a little disco-y, but I fucking love that album. I love that album. Question in the audience? Well, while we're waiting, David, condiment, your, your Desert Island condiment, everyone's dying to know. Uh, any French Canadians here? Nope. Um, no, that's a food. Um, that's a full food group. Uh, chow Chow. You can look it up. Chow Chow. Yeah. It's a relish. It's a green tomato relish. Type of relish. Type, the relish. type of relish. We got one more question, Janelle? All right, Jim. Where? Jim's in the house. David, with all the uh, Dave's picks and everything, are, they, are you going to do any kind of special release with Dead & Company, like on vinyl? I know with like Nugs and all that, you can like scan your ticket. And with the digital world, you can get it all. But are you gonna take like a like a you know fall tour 17 and do like a Europe 72 like greatest hits of that and release it on vinyl? <clears throat> yes, we'll do. We're gonna do a lot more vinyl. I think. I think that the interest is there, and we love doing it. And we do agree it sounds really good. Uh, the trouble with Grateful Dead music, and I remember 15 years ago before vinyl had really made a comeback. And people would say, you know, what if this was 20 years ago? Could you do Dick's Picks? And we thought, no way, because 20 minute sides, 21 minutes, whatever it is, it would be tough to break these up. We've kind of come to terms with that, so we do break up a lot of, we have to, we break up a lot of jams when we do things on vinyl. But overall, it sounds so good, people like it, and people like the large format. So, yes, I, we'll do more. I don't know what we'll do, but we'll, we've got ideas for a few good things. Does it? Awesome questions, guys. And how was your first course? How were those egg rolls? Uh, how was that sweet beer? It was a sweet companion to your night. So we're going to jump right into the Q&As here. And uh, as the night goes on, we drink more together. We realize it gets harder to listen. But a lot of people came from far away for tonight. As far away as Ohio. Where'd you come from? Hollywood. Holy shit. Are you here to discover my friend Derek to be in films, adult films? Hollywood, that's awesome. Thank you for the coming coast to coast. But with that note, we do ask that if you give us your attention while we're up here. A lot of folks have come from far and wide for this. And with that, Janelle, let's do two social media questions and then open it up to the floor for some questions. Ready, David? She's going to need a microphone. All right. 
Uh, I have not given you guys a heads up to this question because I just got it from, from our friends at the Grateful Dead. Um, so this question comes from the Grateful Dead's social media channels. Uh, this is for both of you, actually. So maybe start with David, then Sam. Um, what was your most exciting experience working with the Grateful Dead? Uh, this, uh, it would be, I can pinpoint it to uh, February 8th, 2019. It was a very special night working with this guy. Um, I've had, you know, every single day, a lot of people have asked me, uh, what's a typical day for me? And there's no typical day. It's every, everything I do is always something different, working on a new project, work coming here and going to wherever. But I, I remember once in 2001, I was, I, I usually would stay at work until about eight or nine at night. And one day I had to get out early because I, I was going to see you 2 at the Oakland Coliseum. So I, I was cleaning up the vault. I had to get out of there by like six or so. And I get a knock on the, on the vault door. I was like, shh, I got to go to the show. And I knock on the, on, knock on the vault door. And the, the vault's pretty far from Oakland Coliseum, about an hour in traffic, hour and a half. And I open the door and the edge, the guitar player from U2 was at the door. So uh, I opened it up and gave him about two hours in the vault. I was worried I was going to be late for the show. And he said, he's man, if I'm not at the show, we're not starting. So... I had he and his wife in with for about two hours just talking about tapes. He was so humble, loved talking about tapes. Then Weir came in, and to hear them talk tapes and, and go over each of the Dead's great, uh, live multi-track tapes was pretty exciting. So that was cool, and then hearing Bono talk about The Edge's visit to the vault that night at the show, that was kind of cool. Um, Bono at the end of the night said from the stage, he says, hey, earlier today, The Edge was fortunate to go visit the Grateful Dead up at their studio in their vault, and we just love how they thrive outside the mainstream. And I said, that's exactly what we do. It's kind of what you do. You thrive outside the mainstream. So I love that. I, I do love, I love every day at work. Every day is something different. I wake up and I get to listen to a new show or work on a new project with New York or come here, whatever it is. So always fun. That's nice, David. Um, and uh, so I can't do the same day as you because I wasn't there with The Edge. Uh, and you also mentioned a day which has been a great day. Um, and actually, I, I got back, we had a Dogfish leadership uh, team meeting offsite this morning, which was really great. And uh, listening to what different departments at our company are doing, I'm just so impressed and proud of, of my coworkers. And I came back before I got to do the event with David, and I told Connie, who I work next to every day, I'm like, oh, man, there's some awesome things going on at this company right now. So give, if you would give a hand to the Dogfish coworkers that put this event on. <laughs> um, but I, I, I would have to say a, a favorite day of mine, and Tim A., who's filming somewhere here today, uh, knows this because he came to my house to do a marketing thing for the collaboration of the Grateful Dead and none of the records that I own from the Grateful Dead were down in my record collection and he's like what the fuck I thought you were a big Dead fan and, and it's because they were all in my son's room and he stole them from me and that baton passing was a pretty uh, favorite Grateful Day moment for me I'm going to ask one more, and then I'm going to come to the audience. This one comes from the Grateful Dead's uh, Instagram as well. This is a tough one, so I hope you guys are ready. Thanks, Dave. If members of the Dead were beer ingredients, who would be what? Whoa! Mind blown. I'm so sorry. Bob Wheat. I was going to say, who's the prickly pear? Um... You tell us. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're all good guys. They're all extremely unique individuals, um, which is, I think, what makes them as cool as they are musically and as people. So I, I don't know which one is the hops. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, they all have something special, and, and they're all extremely different people. Um, they're unique personalities. Personality goes far. Before Chicago happened, before they re reunited as a full band of living members, what's that now, five, four years ago? Uh, yeah, four years ago. Did you think that day would come for as long as you worked with them? Yeah, with the four of them? 
Yes, I, I did. They played together a few times in 03 and 04 and 09. And I, I didn't think by 2014, it seemed pretty certain it wasn't going to happen. And then early 2015, everything changed. And they said, let's do it. Let's, let's go out in style. And then it was a 50th. The Dead felt a big responsibility to the fan base to do something big for the 50th. And that's why that happened. It was, I mean, I'm sure they got paid, but I, they, they really did feel that it was the 50th. They needed to do something big. And it wasn't put out an album. It wasn't do anything like that. It was do something big for the fans. And it was never expected that after the, those shows in San Francisco and Chicago that there would be anything that kept going with that group. So how did that, how, what moment from them announcing those final shows that they announced as their final shows, how did that transition to what's now happening with Dead & Co? Well, they made it clear with those shows that those four guys would never get together again on stage again. And Phil has a venue. This is about 300 people, right? Terrapin Station. Terrapin, Terrapin Crossing, uh, Crossroads. And Phil loves his venue. He loves being there with his family. He's 70. He'll be 79 years his old kids, next month. His boys play with his, him. Yeah, exactly. He gets to play with his kids and he gets his grandson there. His wife is there. He's got a venue very similar size. He's got a terrific restaurant. It's very similar to what you had. You've been there, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a wonderful place. And he loves his scene. He can go to New York and play the Capitol Theater in Port Chester. He just played in Portland and Seattle. I think he's really happy with what he's doing. And so he made it clear he was done with the road. He does occasional shows, but in terms of touring. But the other three guys had so much fun, they wanted to keep it going. And that's how the John Mayer connection happened. And here they are, four years later, with John Mayer still doing Dead & Company. No end in sight. Pretty great. Pretty yeah. great. All right, Janelle. Well, I have a question and a comment. So you kind of touch base on where I am in my current experience with the dead. I have a 21-year-old who literally since being in my stomach has experienced the dead. So like he is and his friends are, are living the dead and I feel like you have a serious like charge because at some point you like the dead is going to be not around anymore and like where do you see the dead in the future generations when the dead is not around? Because my son at 21 is like, we're going to be this dead cover band because the dead is not out there. And, you know, like, God bless him. He's out there and doing open mic. And because he's like, what will happen to the dead when the dead is not the dead? And, he, you know, we have these deep conversations about the best show and this and that. And, like, I feel like you have a big responsibility. Yeah. With the beer, you're good to go. It doesn't matter what you put out there for the next generation. They are going to love your beer. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're all good. Where do you see this? We know we have a big responsibility to, uh, to the fans, to the band's legacy. Where do I see it in 50 years, in 150 years? I, I hope the same place we look at Beethoven now and look back at that and, and people have access to it, whether it's through recordings, whether it's through bands like this, that people are going to be able to get their dead fix, whether it's through the merchandising that we do with the, the New York team that I keep talking about over here. And we just want to make sure that the Grateful Dead are always going to be accessible and whether it's those three or four guys and hopefully they keep going for another 10 or 15 years, but whether it's that or it's this and it's nights like this and here we are 300 people in a room or 200 people and that's what we want to do is make sure that the community stays. And the community is always going to be there, but we can keep with the music and the beer. And, and think of how many people our children's age are looking at John Mayer and they're like, okay, that dude's not that much older than I am. And, and they're getting, he's getting them into this music. And think of how those kids that are into John Mayer are going to inspire kids 15 years younger than them. I'm pretty psyched for the baton passing uh, that's already in process. Okay, I'm a, can I come back to you? I made eye contact with that one and then I made eye contact with the guy back there. It's, I know, shouldn't have made eye contact. So Dave, I just, quick question. So with regard to the Fare Thee Well show, I was just curious as to what the genesis and the catalyst of the Fare Thee Well show was and how the dead selected Trey as the lead guitarist for Jerry's Licks. I don't know how they selected Trey. Um, I, he was the right guy for the job. 
Um, how it came about was the 50th, and around 2000, well, we started on the archival side, on the legacy side, looking in 2013, and that's when we started thinking, what can we do? Because we have no sway over the band. We couldn't tell them, you guys got to get out on the road and do something big for it. So we do a weekend on the legacy, and I remember fall of 2014, there was no word of, of, of any kind of shows for 2015, and then I remember in early 2015 hearing that it wasn't going to happen, and I was disappointed. I, I wanted, personally, I wanted to go to some shows, have a last hurrah, and whether that was going to be Madison Square Garden for a couple of nights or whatever it was going to be, and then very quickly that changed, and I think it was the recognition that it was the 50th anniversary. They were hearing it from fans. They were hearing it online. You got to do something, and it wasn't out of a sense of guilt or anything. It was a sense of responsibility. It was a sense of, I don't want to say duty. It, they they love doing it. But I think they recognized it the same way we did. They said, holy cow, we've been around 50 years. Let's mark this properly. So they booked the Chicago shows. And I remember thinking, because at that point, all of the bands that had come since Jerry passed, they can sell 15,000. They can sell 18,000. Sometimes they can sell 9,000. How are they going to sell 74? And the interest was so sky high. People went nuts for it. As you know, it sold out instantly. 74,000 a night set Soldier Field records. Then they booked the San Francisco shows. But I think the suggestion was there, well, you got a tour now. And they said, no. Phil was serious. Phil was done with the road. He's, you know, he's had some health problems going back 25 years. And he's overall very healthy. But in those many years, hopefully he's got left, it's, he's very happy with his Terrapin Crossroads, his life with his kids and playing with them. And so it made sense. I'm coming. Here I come. So David, every morning I listen to your Today in Grateful Dead history. Every single morning. <laughs> on my way to work, it helps, helps calm me. Um, but my question to you is, I was born in 91, so I have always lived the Grateful Dead. It's been a part of my life, my entire life. Both my parents have been to over 50 shows. My father's been to over 200 shows. So I don't have a beginning point. So my favorite question is... And this is to both of you. Can you tell us about your first show with the Grateful Dead? Oh, our first shows. Uh, my first show, I remember every second of it. And I think some people go to shows. A lot of people I know have been dragged to shows, and they didn't know anything about the dead, so they remember nothing. And they'll tell me their first show, and I'll say, holy cow, you saw an amazing show. And like, I don't remember anything. I was such a massive deadhead by that point. No, uh, November 85. The Dead were playing in Rochester, New York, and I wanted to go. I was four, it was my 15th birthday, and I wanted to go. All my, I lived in Ottawa, Canada, and all of my friends' older brothers went to the show, and I wanted to go so badly. Mom said, you can't go to Rochester, New York. You're 15 years old. So I went out with my friends. We got drunk. I got mugged. We got beaten up and mugged. 15? It was, no, it was, oh, this is in Ottawa. We didn't even make it to Rochester. So it was, it was a horrible night. And then 1986, I was ready to go then Jer for the fall tour, and then Jerry got sick. So there was no show. So spring 87, by that point, I'd been trading tapes for three years and listening nonstop to Grateful Dead. So my point is, my first show, Hartford Civic Center, I was, uh, it was a 326.87, and I was, if, if you're the stage, if you're the band, I was up on Brent's side in the second last row at the far end of the thing. Of the, of the arena, and I vividly remember every second of that show. They opened with Midnight Hour into Cold Rain and Snow, and there was a bird song to this day. It's one of my favorite bird songs. There was a, the second set was the highest energy second set I think I ever saw, and I knew it then. I said, this is better than any tape I've ever heard, and it was up there. And my mom drove me to the show. It was a 10-hour drive, because I told her I was taking a train overnight from Canada to New York City at 16, and I was gonna, and she said, just get in the car. And so she drove me and my buddy, and she was a, she's, she's a good mom. Yeah. yeah, so I remember it well. That's right, the women are smarter. God bless the moms. Uh, mine was right down the road from here, and I was talking to two brothers in the room tonight about the shows at RFD. And, 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 uh, is that the, what, what's in it, JFK? 
Ah, I got dyslexia, guys. I got dyslexia. But in D.C., I'm right... A, so in D.C., my first show was my wife, Mariah, who grew up right up the road from here in Milford. Myself, a local guy named Rick Burton, who's... Uh, his little sister's now, now married to Mariah's little brother. It's fucking Delaware, people. We interbreed. <laughs> uh, but I remember walking into that parking lot and be like, holy shit, this is awesome. And then getting into the show and being like, holy shit, this is an awesomer watching the band. So that was a beautiful night for me. All right, we have a question over here. I promise to come to her. Hi. Uh, my name is Megan from Virginia. There are moments in everybody's life that can make a weekend or make a lifetime. And for myself personally, watching Brewmasters was a lifetime uh, moment. And um, my, my question is for Dave. What song changed your life for The Grateful Dead? Because everybody is a deadhead. Everybody has heard of the dead. But what song changed you? Uh, you know, I'd say the first song I heard because I knew instantly that this band was for me. But I'll tell you a funny story. So that, and that song was The Golden Road. But uh, in high school, a friend, I was in grade 10, I think. And a friend gave me, he said, oh, you're into the dead. My dad has dead records. You want them? I said, yeah, yeah. So he gave me this weird, it was a kind of quasi bootleg from 1973 called Historic Dead, kind of a weird album. And he gave me Europe 72. So I was like, oh yeah. So I was like, great, Europe 72. So I put on Europe 72, side one, two, three, and four. And then I noticed that there's also a side five and six, a third LP that wasn't in there. So I, I got into this album. I listened to it for years, for maybe two years, three years, knowing side one through four. And I was like, I was, uh, what's this morning? And I knew Morning Dew, but I didn't know that Morning Dew. So I, I didn't know what it was about. So I finally got an LP of Europe 72. I was, uh, I was in Syracuse, New York. I got it at a record store. And I bring it home and I put on the third LP, which is Truckin' and the Jam and then the Jam and then Morning Dew. And I heard that Morning Dew. And that was the one that, and I, man, I, by that point, I was listening to Nothing But Dad. So I knew what I was listening to. But it was so head and shoulders above anything I'd ever heard before. And I said, okay. So for years, I didn't even know Europe 72 had that. And, uh, and then when I finally heard it, I said, geez, I was missing the best part. But that was a big, the big life changer. Guys, guys, I came all the way up here. Look up here. Oh Over here. Where's Oprah? Right oh, here. Oprah. Over here. What yes. do we win? What do we win, Oprah? All the things. You okay, want everything. super, Janelle. All right, we have a question up here on the mezzanine. Hello, I'm Adam from beautiful New Jersey. Woo, New Jersey in the house! <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to thank you so much for not putting patchouli in this beer. We got that request. We got that request. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm so glad you didn't do it. Thank you. But my question is, when is the dead going to come back to Vegas? My wife and I saw two opening... Years, dead shows in Vegas, dead and company. And last year they didn't do it. We're hoping they'll come back this spring. And before David answers that, let the record show that the dead played almost every state in our country, but they didn't play five states in this country, one of which is Delaware. We got to work on that before we bring them back to Vegas. But I'll, I'll let David talk about Vegas. I don't know how they book their stuff. I, I like Vegas. I, I mean, it's a little overwhelming, but uh, I hope they go back. Everyone has fun when they go there. I used to go see fish there a lot and uh, had some good times in Vegas. Almost too much fun. So no commitments there. Who the hell knows? Who the hell knows? Janelle? Last one, and she said it would only take five are... seconds. I'm sorry, Ryan Schwamberger. I'm sorry. Ready, guys? You've been great. One more question. Oh my Ready? God. I feel like this is going to be a terrible last question. We get one more time, too. Janelle, don't we get it one more time? Okay, this oh, is go, my last go, question. Joe. Go, it's going to be a terrible last question, so I feel bad. Damn. I just want to know if you do rocket yoga with Bill, with uh, Bobby. Nope. Damn it. Okay. I don't hang Jason. with him enough. Give it to Jason. Okay. Real question. Right, that was a terrible last question. I would like to know. 
all things considered, knowing that this is your job and uh, you have an overwhelming task to take in all of the shows all of the time because you are the archivist. When it's your time, it's actually two questions. No. <laughs> when it's your time, what is David's favorite show? That's my first question. And I'm not talking your favorite because of the best thing that you've mixed. But when you've got to put something in, you're like, this is the show that I want to like loosen my brain up to. And I like this for me, not for what I have to put out and to archive for the fans, but for me. I want to know what yours. And then my second question is just, if you could burn me a copy of 88 from Rosemont, that would be great. Favorite show, uh, again, comes back to the Desert Island question, and it might be the London 72, the second night of Europe 72, or Philly Spectrum, just up the road in 72 also. Uh, 921 72. I mean, again, I love so much, but if you're putting a gun to my head and I have to answer it right now... There are no guns involved. I would, thank you. I would go with those two. You're Canadian. Um, one. Yep. Find us a soundboard and we'll put it out. My, I was born uh, 11870 um, in, in New Jersey. And uh, about 35 miles away while I was born at 830 at night, the dead were playing one of the best shows they ever played. And again, I shy away from best and favorites, but it truly was one of the best shows they ever played. And I was, I met, I was born at 830. And my mom could have gotten a car by nine, driven me to the show, caught the dark star, but she didn't. But uh, we don't have a soundboard tape, so the show's not coming out anytime soon. There's a uh, kind of an okay audience tape. That's, that's going to wrap it up for this section, but you guys are coming back. And we, we're not interested in food? We'll be back. We'll be back. All right, guys, this is it. This is our last... Q&A section as your desserts come along. Uh, Jim's going to have a question. In time, Jim, in time. We got questions in the room. We know that. Uh, before uh, we get to the questions, uh, the, 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 the spirit that you got, the, the short tulip-shaped glass uh, that you got, as, as most of you guys uh, know, Dogfish is not just a brewery. We're also a distillery. We've got a beautiful, Jill is running the jewels on the spirits every day. Uh, but we have a beautiful R &D, little R&D distillery here in Rehoboth and our big distillery, uh, bigger, up in uh, Milton. And in the same way that Dogfish Head found some white space in beer for being very culinary oriented for 25 years, similarly our distillery, which is about 14 years old, ha has focused on finding unique ways to bring culinary ingredients into spirits. And the one you have in front of you is called uh, Sonic Archaeology, which is the fastest growing spirit in, in the history of our distillery, much like, I hope you they give it up for, for Sonic. Uh, uh, much like Sequench is the fastest growing beer in the history of our company. And similarly, they are mashups. In the case of Sequench, it's a mashup of a Berliner Weiss, a Kolsch, and a Goza with uh, black limes, lime juice, and salt. Uh, similarly, Sonic Archaeology was, uh, we, we got a, a great call from uh, PBS uh, and uh, Jack White uh, and Robert Redford, and they were doing a show celebrating uh, the moment in musical history when uh, sort of country music, um, gospel music uh, uh, converged for the birth of rock and roll, like, which coincided with Prohibition. And they asked us to do a spirit to celebrate uh, that moment of those genres coalescing into rock and roll. So we took a, a, a mashup of spirits, in this case brandy, uh, whiskey, uh, and rum, and then we infused it with some pomegranate juice and some lemon juice to make uh, sonic archaeology. And uh, that, 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 that threading of different genres is certainly relevant to the journey of the Grateful Dead, uh, who started out, uh, you know, kind of more... Uh, well, maybe I'm going to ask David to kind of talk about the evolution of genres from Pigpen uh, to, to today. 
<laughs> uh, you know, they were, they were genre busting. Um, yeah, it, I mean, I think the only way to describe Grateful Dead music is that it is American music. It's uniquely American music where they took every genre and turned it into their own unique style that is called Grateful Dead music. And I hear it all the time where people say, oh, you've got to hear this band. They sound a lot like the dead. You'll love them. And nobody sounds remotely like the Grateful Dead. So um, they've a little bit of everything. So, you know, people say, oh, is it blues? Is it jazz? Is it? Yeah, it's all of that. It's bluegrass. It's country. It's rock and roll. It's, uh, it's everything. It's every kind of music you can imagine put together. So that's what I love about the dead is that every single piece of music they made is different. It's probably why, I don't know, I bet there's other people who share this with me in the room. Those of us that have to travel in our cars a lot and listen to radio stations in our car a lot, it's amazing how many people are like, the only channel I can keep on for a long road trip is the dead channel. Yeah, uh, does anyone else feel that? I feel that. My whole family feels that. Seven. You missed it. So we're going to do our last Q&A, and Janelle has been running the jewels on this whole event. She is our Oprah. Give it up for Janelle. You get an answer, and you get an answer. Um, all right, this one comes from uh, one of our fans on social media. Does American Beauty, the beer, remind you more of a 74 Eyes or a 69 Dark Star? That was good, right? That, that is a, that, I think it's a great question. Shh, this is seriously profound, guys. That is a great question. That is a great question, and to me, it's a really simple answer. It, it's, uh, it's a 74 Eyes. In that, and I love a 69 Dark Star, but to me, that's chaos. That's Primal Dead. That's Psychedelic Powerhouse which I love, and that's not this beer. Uh, this beer is, it's smooth, and it's controlled, and it's focused. Balanced. And it's balanced, and it's exactly like what an Eyes of the World 1974 is, which is the dead at their jazziest peak. Great answer. Great answer, great question. Last one from our social media fans, I promise. What would be the answer to the answer, man? You know, that's a lyric from a Grateful Dead song, as you know, and uh, I, yeah, I do not, I mean, I have my own interpretation of every single Grateful Dead lyric, and that's for me, and just as everybody here has probably got their own interpretation, so there's, you got, it's, it's whatever answer you want to give it. Yeah. Short answer, right answer, take that answer, man. This one is written down, but it is from an audience member, and we wrote it down so we wouldn't forget it. Uh, this one comes from Stick, that's part of the Arena's crew. Is there any other show or concert that's not recorded that you wish you had access to? Deep question. You know, I wouldn't know because if, if, it's not, if I haven't heard it, I don't know how good it is or not, but... There's one show, and I've talked about it recently, um, from Tulsa in, uh, 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 40 years ago this week. And it's the last of the Grateful Dead shows for which there's no, no known recording at all. So nobody even knows if it's a good show or not. It, you know, frankly, that tour wasn't very good, so probably not. But I'd love to hear that because there's no known recording. So if anybody can ever find Tulsa, February 79, I'd love to hear it. Otherwise, we talked about this 11870 show. And I would love to hear a good board table. There's a lot of shows in 1970 in particular that there's some pretty mediocre audience tapes. I'd love to hear a good recording of those. And they just weren't recorded. Bear was in jail. So. Can, can you talk about, earlier today we were chatting about you guys put out a box set of kind of the, the Grateful Dead did a, did a, a moment where they were kind of like the, the moment of uh, Johnny Cash on a stage. I think it was the Grand Old Opry where it was, he put out his middle finger to the establishment of country music. Similarly, in the Grateful Dead trajectory, they, they took a moment where they're like, fuck you, record labels, and they did their own thing, and, and they released, I think, at least three studio albums yep. on their own indie uh, label, but you guys re resurrected a live show that was kind of not recognized 
to the degree it might have been. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so what Sam's talking about, 1973, the Dead started their own record company and put out three incredible, I think incredible, uh, studio records in 73, 74, and 75. And then in 76, they capped off the record label, which was financially a disaster. It's, it's a lot harder to run your own record company than, than it is to go through Warner Brothers, I guess. But they put out a live album that, you know, it, it was widely considered one of the worst Grateful Dead albums ever. Um, no, not one of. It was widely considered the worst. And we've finally been able in 1920, when we put this out, 2018, to make it sound so good using good mastering technology now that it finally sa sounds good. And that's something we're able to do in the, in the studio a lot is make these old recordings I mean, we can't enhance them. We can't change how it was played. But the, the, what we've learned is that these shows were played really well. They just were mixed and uh, mastered pretty poorly. So now they sound really good. So that was a 1976 record. It was disastrous, but uh, they were done with it. So, Can you find that digitally for the folks that... The, the, the box set sold out, right? Uh, so the can vinyl. You, can these guys find it digitally or anywhere? Yeah, it's probably on Spotify or some kind of download. Actually, we, we remastered those albums in high resolution, so they are on high resolution sites, HD tracks and things. Nice. nice. All right, Janelle. You've been very patient. You guys are great. Thank as you. much alcohol as we've had, the, the way you guys are listening, holy shit. Thank you. Thank you, guys. This is, this is cool. Because uh, how often does David Lemieux come to... Coastal Delaware. It's pretty cool. Every seven years. He's like a comet. Well, well no, not to steal the thunder from you, but I love Charlie Miller, if you know who Charlie Miller sure. is. He's awesome. Um, who does Jerry Band uh, album releases? You know, I don't know. Um, I know they release a lot of good stuff. Um, I think it's largely their manager, the, the manager of the estate, a guy named Mark Allen. And a great guy, and I think he's largely behind the, the archive of release series of the Garcia estate. So we used to do them with Grateful Dead Productions, and about probably 10 years ago, they went and did their own thing, and they've been releasing some really good shows. Mark? Mark Allen? No. He, he, no all the Grateful Dead is done through Rhino and, and GDP, and then Mark handles the Garcia estate. Does a good job with it, too. Hey Dave. Ooh, hello. So, what is your? F I know you don't do favorites. Possibly favorite Grateful Dead cover tune. Personally, being second that emotion. Second that emotion is my favorite. Well, Grateful Dead cover of that tune. I like Morning Dew, and I love Not Fade Away in certain eras, and I love Dancing in the Street, both the, the 1970 arrangement and the 77, 76. Um, I love Good Lovin', I, pig, pig Pen arrangements of it. Um, I like a lot of Dead Guy. You know, if we're talking a shorter song, if you want the, like, the short answer of a short song, Big River. I love Big River, and I love, I've not yet, I've met a lot of Grateful Dead songs I don't like very much. I mean, versions of them where I'd say, oh, that's a terrible version. I've never met a Big River I don't like. Like, every single one I've heard is, they just bring it up. So I love Big River. I love El Paso. Great question. I'm going to follow Ramsey's question with another one to David, which is, what's your favorite uh, cover that a non-dead band or artist did of a dead song? There was, a, there was a San Francisco punk band in the 80s called Pot Up Eyes, and they did Truckin', which was crazy. Super fast. Um, super fast. Um, truckin'. They did Truckin'. They did Truckin'. Um, I like Bertha by uh, Los Lobos. I think it's a, it, they do a, a very, they make it their own, but it's a very true arrangement of it, and I like that. Um, did you hear, uh, I'm sure you did, but the guys from The National a few years ago did a beautiful where they invited a bunch of indie artists. Uh, I forget the name of that double album, but it was beautiful. Terrific album, good friends of mine, yeah. and uh, that wonderful Grateful Dead covers. There's a lot of them. It's, you know, it's, uh, this is you know, the question, where are the dead going to be in 20 years? And it's going to be bands, big bands, like The National and Los Lobos, and we had Jane's Addiction do something 25, 30 years ago. 
Yeah, the ripple. So we're going to see more of that, I think, where, where the national guys, they took years to produce that record, and they got some of the best independent musicians around to do incredible dead covers. And it took them probably three years to put that album together because they wanted to make it right. So I think we're going to see more of that, where you get musicians who, and the guys in the national are younger than me, but they're, they're probably in their 40s, their late 30s, 40s. And these people are going to start recognizing the dead for what they are, and they're going to start doing it. So I, I hope so. Good stuff. Janelle? Coming around this way. I'm coming this way. You had your hand up. Gentlemen, good evening. Uh, two questions. Actually, maybe three. Dave, your thoughts on 52677 as an official release? Second, I asked you earlier at the brewery, uh, ideas for this year's box set. And Sam, please bring back Squall. And please bring back Hellhound on my ale. Please. I got it, Sam, I'm going to tell you right now. That's not a question, that's a demand. It is, it is. And you know what? I've got 150 people hostage right now. Brian uh, Selders, <laughs> Brian no, Selders, will you make a verbal contract to brew a batch of Hellhound in Rehoboth? Oh, wait, in who's, on, who's in charge here? Here's the, will wait you do it, Brian Selders? Hold wait. on. Sam. Catch I, it. Oh, here we go. Come on. Come on. Consider it done. Oh, shit. I, I just got to add one thing to add to Sam. Check, check, check. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. All right, I answered my question. Now you're on the hot seat, my friend. Uh, the question was about a show in Baltimore, uh, 1977, and he was asking, will it ever be released? And I don't know. We don't have a grand plan. We, we've got really no... Go but I will say, it's spring of 77, so there's a good chance someday it'll get released. And, and I, I think as highly of it as you do. Great show from, uh, from May 26, 77, Baltimore Civic. What was, what was the other question? Oh, uh, box set this year. Yeah, we're going to have one. Next. Great answer. Is that one of the most requested releases that hasn't come through? Uh, it isn't. I, those who know, know. And it is a really good show. We've released a lot of Spring 77, most of it. Um, there are a few shows left, and that's one of them. And it is a good show. It's a really crazy show. All right, I popped... Oh, oh, that was loud. I popped over here, guys. You, do you guys like your shirts? Yes. We got tie-dye shirts from Jim. They're incredible. Thank you, Jim. Jim, we love our shirts. Great question. Can you get your phone ready? Can we do a video of, of us saying we love your shirts? Can, how cool would it be if we can get Dave? Can you pull out your phone and let's do a short video of getting Dave saying, they don't say Grateful Dad. He doesn't have to license them. Do you, who's got a phone at Dave's table? Okay, let's get this thing as a little infomercial. You guys ready to be part of an infomercial? Okay, all right, you ready? All right, uh, are you rolling? Okay, Jim, ask the question. You guys like my shirts? We love your shirts. We love JimShirts.com! <laughs> that was nice. All right. all right, one more question. All right, this, this one's for Dave. In that you're a video guy, what do you have in mind for Meetup at the Movies for 2019 or 2020? 20, uh, 2020, again, it comes back to no grand plan. Uh, we, a lot of people say, so, you know, do you have this one slated for release? I honestly, we've got a 1970 show coming out in a couple months. I have no idea what's coming after that. But we do have an idea for uh, this year. We do a yearly thing where we put a Grateful Dead show in movie theaters around the country. And so... It gets people out, and that's what we want to do. The one thing we can't do as a legacy thing is get people in a room as a community. We can tonight, and Dead and Company do it. They get 50,000 people out. But on the archival release side, we can't do it very often. So we do this thing once a year. So we have a good idea for this year. We're in the process of checking out the tapes, and if the tapes are good, we'll, we'll do that. And if not, we've got a terrific backup. That'll probably be the next year's if it isn't this year's. 
Questions. What do you think, questions. Janelle? We have some time for some questions. Oh, we do? Okay. You're the boss. What do you got? Oh, I see one back here. You guys are awesome. We are doing great. We are learning. We are learning tonight. Together we are learning. Oh, here we go. There's questions up here. God bless you upstairs. You're always my favorite. I just want to say thank, say thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're having a fun night. Are we having a fun night? Question. Holy shit. Hey, David. David, I want to thank you for number 36, Philadelphia Civic oh, yeah. Center, 1974, August the 4th. My wife and I's first show there. Thank you for that release. Thank you. Sweet. Excellent. Excellent first show. Ex excellent date, guys. Good job. That's David, awesome. I have a question for you. I have a question. What's the one piece of trivia that most people don't have the answer to, but you have the answer to? That, that's going in the book. Oh, <laughs> damn. Dang it. The, the, so the, then, then mine would be you go around the world doing events similar to this or interviews with media where there's an open forum for questions. I'm curious, what is the most asked question? Whether it's in an environment like this or just a one-on-one -on -one interview with a journalist? Uh, we get a lot of, what's the biggest challenge of the job? And I do get that all the time. What is the biggest challenge? And I don't know. I think, you know, what we always try to do is everything we release, we've been doing this for archival releases have been coming out by the dead almost 30 years. I've been doing it for 20. And it's always outdoing ourselves and always making sure that whatever we did last, as great as it was, that the next one is going to be better. And every time we release something, we say, how can we beat this? How can we do anything better? And we do, I think we do. And this goes back to 2004, we did a Fillmore West box set, the vinyl thing I gave you, but it was the whole box set. And we did this 10 CD thing, and we said, well, we're done. Like this, we're not, and since then, 2004, every year, we've done something on a big scale that I think has been better every year. And then in the Dave's Picks, the archival releases, we just put one out from 1977, and in a lot of people's opinion, it's the best one yet. And here we are, 29 into that, plus 36 Dick's Picks and 17 other things in the middle. Plus other things, it's still, we're releasing things that people are arguably saying this is the best thing yet that you've put out. And that's what we hope to do, that when we hit Dave's Picks number 78, it's the same thing where people say, Shit, this is the best thing you've put out. That's what we aim for. So that's a challenge, but it's a good one. Great answer. Great answer. I think, I Raising think, the bar on yourselves. I think you guys have crushed it this evening and as have you Janelle you're as have you Janelle <laughs> thank you you actually are dismissed at this point oh shit and did she just cancel me <laughs> no, no 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 you're not canceled oh, you're just, just dismissed. dismissed right right and you can go about the evening with all of your new best friends yeah, and yeah. yeah at any rate guys I hope uh, 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 the, the boys la line to the bathroom was very long tonight and that warmed my heart because I got to talk to a lot of people, and a lot of people told me just how much fun they've had tonight and that they'll remember tonight. And will you guys uh, join me in, in, in thanking David for spending this time with us tonight? <laughs> this has been a great night. I, I, I really do mean it. People ask, what is the highlight of my job? 20 years with these guys. Every day is fun, but in terms of events, in terms of things I've done, this is going to be hard to top. So let's make it less than seven years. This has really been a fun time, and I want to thank everybody for coming. Sam, your whole team, it's been incredible. So thank you. This is the highlight. <laughs>